Um, it's Hugh, Ian and Andy who will talk to us. They are from Nethril Trust and they will talk about managing a path inventory in OpenStreetMap. And we're excited and please, it's your stage. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, it's great to be here at uh, State of the Map again. I, I did a talk back in 2013 and we were sort of thinking about what we might want to do with OpenStreetMap as an organization and it's great to come back here and talk to you a bit about something that we are doing and, and, and how we're starting to contribute back. Um, so yeah, to introduce ourselves, uh, I think it's got my name on the program, but I've brought my colleagues who are uh, much more adept at the technical side of things. So I'm Hugh Davis from National Trust and Ian Dawes and, and Andy Woods who are working on the project. Um, so first of all, a little bit about National Trust for those guys who uh, aren't from the UK or you don't know us. Um, National Trust is uh, Europe's largest conservation charity. Um, we were founded at the end of the 19th century by a group of Victorians who, um, they wanted to protect beautiful places um, in, in perpetuity and particularly to give people access to those places. Um, we have 5.5 million members in the UK um, and our membership model is the primary source of, of funding for all of the, of the conservation work we do. Uh, in the UK. Uh, we cover, we're quite unique as a, as a, as a charity because we cover the, the heritage and the, uh, the, the nature conservation side of things. Um, we have a, a large portfolio of property. We look after around 250,000 hectares of land. We have around 350 historic houses, um, 780 miles of coastline and so on. Um, so for us, it's a, it's a real challenge trying to uh, manage all of those assets. Um, which is why um, a tool like OpenStreetMap is really interesting to us. Uh, we also have uh, a tremendous pool of volunteers for the National Trust, around 70,000 volunteers. Um, so we're kind of interested in how we can, how we can use um, open source products and crowdsourcing uh, more to, to support the work we're doing. So uh, uh, a bit about um, access. So we're, we're an access organization. Um, and we provide broad public access to our properties through around 20,000 kilometers um, of, of PARs. We think we have around 20,000 kilometers. Um, one of the reasons that we're doing this project is we don't have any central records or a central database um, of, of, of PARs. Um, but we do know that walking is the most popular activity at National Trust. We think we have around 300 million visits um, for, for people walking on, on our properties. Um, and um, so, so clearly, it's really important that we, that we understand the scale of this asset and we're and we managing it effectively. So the problem that we're really trying to solve with this project is, first of all, quantity. So knowing how many, um, or how many miles or how many kilometers of path we look after is important to us. Um, you know, it helps us um, engage with visitors who, who maybe don't think of the National Trust as a, as a, as a walking organization or providing access in that way. Um, as I say, we don't currently know how many miles of footpath we look after, uh, and therefore it's difficult to manage. Um, we, we, we're also um, keen to make sure that we're providing access in the right places. So, um, you know, we, we, we know we have um, piles all over our land, but actually it's important to make sure that we have really good access provision around the places where people live so that we can provide more public access in those areas. Um, quality. Um, we want to provide people with really great experiences when they come to our places. And uh, for, for many people, um, footpaths and paths are the way people will experience our places. So we want to make sure that they, uh, they remain safe, that, that the paths are, are well maintained, uh, and that actually we can be um, inclusive in the experiences we offer by providing access to people with different needs in terms of access. Um, so uh, understanding that dimension and putting sensible um, maintenance schedules around um, path maintenance as well. And also connectivity. So obviously the National Trust aren't operating in a vacuum. Um, there are, uh, uh, we have a, a good statutory um, network of public paths which are, um, uh, are uh, looked after by our local authorities. Um, so we're connecting into other areas. There's also quite a, a lot of um, uh, pub national trails, both for, cycle, for, for cycling and walking. So just moving on to talk a little bit about the project itself. Um, we've kind of built the, the project like a, like a pyramid. So uh, at the bottom of the pyramid um, is, the, is the path inventory. So this is a sort of, we're hoping to create a central register of, of all paths on our land. Um, uh, that would include both 
paths that are statutory, so we have to provide access, but also the ones that are permissive that we provide additional on top of that uh, legal, legal rights of way. Um, on top of there, um, we have something called NT primary paths. So these are the main paths at our places, the way that people get around um, properties. And we know that we need to maintain these paths to a high standard. They have to be well surfaced and in good condition um, to keep up with the volume of people that are using them. And then on top of there, we have NT trails. So this is about the, um, the kind of activities that people will come and do on those, on those paths. So, you know, a trail to go and see um, some important archaeology or interesting archaeology or a nature trail to look at different aspects uh, of habitats and species that might be located on our properties. Um, so we think that a really good trail uh, functionality, digital trail functionality, is built on a solid foundation of, of a good quality paths inventory. Um, and yeah, so we, uh, we have a, obviously our internal um, staff who can help maintain that inventory, but we're also looking to the external community and OpenStreetMap. And one of the reasons that we want to use OpenStreetMap um, is, to, is to help us with that vast task of, of 20,000 kilometers of path. So I'm gonna hand over to Ian, who's gonna take you through the project in more detail. Okay, thank you, Hugh. Okay, so when we started the project, we had to think about what components are gonna make it successful. So first of all, as uh, Hugh has said, we've got to look at all paths. Uh, in the UK, we have very specific uh, land access rights, uh, so the statutory paths we have to get in there, but also the permissive ones, the ones over and above that statutory duty to provide those paths. We wanted the data to be open. One of the issues in the UK is using the ordnance survey data. Every time you use it, you have to pay royalties, it gets very complicated. We wanted a nice open data set to put our paths into. So we thought OpenStreetMap straight away. So we actually went on to OpenStreetMap um, and downloaded the paths to try and answer the question, what length of path have we got? And then it got very complicated. The tagging to answer which is statutory, which is permissive, it didn't give the answer we needed. It didn't, we didn't have the confidence that was, what was in there was correct. So quickly realized we'd need a standard. So establishing a standard tagging scheme for recording paths in the UK situation. Uh, so we've been talking to OSM UK, we've been putting out on the forums, the blogs, for people to put into what that might look like in the UK. Um, then we've got to use the crowd. We can't digitise 20,000 kilometres of path and keep it up to date very effectively ourselves with the technical skills required in OpenStreetMap. We want a crowd. So that crowd is National Trust central staff, regional staff, property, our rangers, they're out every day on these properties, we want those involved, but they're not going to have the time to do a lot of the mapping, so we want to have volunteers, we've got 70,000 volunteers out there, not all of those are obviously outdoor volunteers, but we want to use them, and then we want to use OpenStreetMap, so we've got to combine all those different user groups to have an effective community. Uh, one of the big things we think we need is a rules-based app, uh, online, offline, field editing tool, um, Vespucci is too complicated to give to anyone but dedicated, detailed, technical users, in our opinion. So we want a simple, rule-based app that we can do edits in the field. So we're looking at those. Uh, then one thing we want is a monitor. We want to check changes. Once we've got a good data set that we think is correct with the land access rights and the existence of paths, we want um, any changes to that to be monitored. So we um, have written software to allow uh, a weekly emails to our rangers to say, paths have changed in your area, go take a look. Um, another overhead is publishing. Actually to download a set of open paths from um, OpenStreetMap for the average user to try and get to a mass audience is actually quite a tricky thing to do. So what we're proposing to do is once we've got the data is actually make it very easily, just pass it on basically the same um, licensing rules, but just say here's the data set, it's updated weekly, grab it from here. And then we've got an eye to the trails in the future. We're not actually doing that at the moment, but we've got to understand what we think we're going to do with the trails so that we can start to think about the issues we're going to come across. So those are the components and we're underway. We've done all the stuff mentioned there. Uh, so we've agreed the path tagging standard uh, and we're going out uh, Andy has been going around all summer to a lot of different properties, talking to the rangers and trying to capture for a small number, about 20 of our properties, 
the actual paths on the ground to learn how long that takes, what the interactions are to achieve that. We then have the monitor code written. Um, I'll show that in a second. But we are planning to make this uh, open source, so we'll probably put it through GitHub so you can go and get it from there. So that is our tagging schema. So that is on a, a wiki link, uh, OSM wiki. Um, the URL is at the end of the presentation. So if you want to go on, look at the schema we're proposing, comment on it, anything like that, please feel free. OK, so as I said, we have written monitoring app. Uh, I hope that's readable from up there. So basically, uh, this is what it looks like. The green, which doesn't show up that well, are our property boundaries. Here we're looking at Hole in the Cut in uh, North Somerset. Uh, and what we have, oh, I keep losing the mouse, sorry. Is a bounding box for each property, which is the area we're monitoring. So each of our properties have a bounding box. We have the current full uh, OpenStreetMap uh, highways network. We include the highways because obviously there's a connectivity between those and the paths. And then we have a weekly monitor. So on a weekly basis, on a Saturday night, I think it is, it runs and looks at all changes that have occurred on National Trust land within those bounding boxes. And if there is changes, it picks up the email address from the bounding box and it sends an email to our rangers to say, go take a look. So what that looks like is that's one of the areas that I'm just focusing on there. Uh, so it's stylized so you can see what's been created, what's been deleted, whether tags have changed, whether geometries have changed, or whether both have changed. And what you can do here is it highlights the object there, you can look across and you can see that this way highlighted was changed by Sailor Steve from what AJW92 said, which is Andy. And all that it changed was a bit of geometry and actually changed tag foot from yes to permissive. So we just have that sort of level information. That, that's quite a pedantic little one, but there are quite often quite large changes. So that, we are planning to make that uh, open source, so it's Python code uh, that goes out and uses the overpass API to get the information. Oh. Sorry, I actually closed the PowerPoint, not moved it. So the next thing we're doing, which is next summer, is we basically want to start looking more at the trails. So using ODI, Open Data Institute uh, standard, to try and look at that. Uh, we want to extend the attributes, so we're very much focusing on the existence and the legal access to those paths. But then we want to start looking at condition, accessibility, those kinds of uh, attributes. And we want to encourage wider adoption with other landowners and interest groups. It's great doing it on National Trust land, but we want a national map. And then phase three is we want to get all of our trails into open active format and then uh, put that open data out, in, out there and we want app developers and everything to actually take that data and create interesting products for it, interesting ways of navigating, going around. We don't want to do that innovation and development. We'll provide the data and let other people do so. Uh, so the tagging schema is, again is there. I'm not going to go into that in detail, but basically we're... we're focusing on the designation, the physical side of things, and then uh, optionally we're looking at some of the extended attribution. Uh, I'm now going to hand to Andy to go through some of the case studies we found of uh, interesting examples of problems. 
Thanks, Ian. So I'm going to talk through some case studies as a result of working with our properties. So over the summer, we've worked with a um, handful of properties just to look at um, trialing the method that we've sort of presented here today, but also identify any issues before taking them further. So one which is quite common is where um, the route which is mapped in OpenStreetMap, so the, the green dotted line here, doesn't necessarily match the definitive information provided by local authorities. So in this instance, the, um, the route here was verified on the ground. So the ranger team we spoke to said that this is correct. We, in fact, we went to uh, visit this example as it's quite, quite near to us. Um, and you can, the reason that it's sort of is correct is there's a very sort of well-established track which is there on the ground, and there's also a bridleway sign just to the to the west of where the route meets the road. So in this instance, we expect that the definitive line is in fact incorrect, and the main reason we think this is it's quite unlikely there's a water crossing where that bridge is, and. Um, that, uh, that the road which sort of connects the two there is quite well established. It's, it's obviously been there quite a long time. So we followed this one a bit further and we went and spoke to the local authority about this and they realigned the definitive right away to meet the top section. So it's been on the sort of uh, left hand side, it now meets the top bit where the road sort of starts. They didn't have enough justification to move the entire bridal way onto National Trust land. There just wasn't enough evidence. So it's an interesting case in terms of our in terms of our case study. I suppose if the whole bridal way moved onto National Trust land, there's reason that we can tag that as a uh, public bridal way. But for now, we have a sort of situation where the beginning section matches the definitive line, and the rest doesn't necessarily match it. And if it was a public bridal way, there's a different duty of care. So the local authority would be responsible for the surface vegetation. But as it stands, there's a bit of ambiguity between sort of the permissive access and the legal access. The next example I'll talk you through is a, a piece of access land. So in this instance, the mem any member of the public has a legal right, what's called a right to roam, to walk anywhere in the yellow shaded area. So um, they don't need a path to access any um, section on that land. But in addition to that, there is, again, a bridal way. Um, so they have a legal right to horse ride and cycle along that line, as well as walk anywhere in the yellow shaded area. When we went to speak to the local team about this, they flagged to us that this uh, public bridal way, in fact, goes over some quite sensitive habitat, which um, potentially could be uh, cause additional erosion damage from horse riders and cyclists. And in fact, there's a track which has been mapped further to the south, which is far more suitable for bridal way traffic in this instance. And in fact, what they, they said to us is it's the route which is most commonly used. So in terms of our tagging schema, it's an interesting example. So we wouldn't not want to say that, um, not want to tag the route going to the north, that it's a public bridal way. But I suppose in an ideal situation, in terms of routing, we'd want people to use the um, more suitable track to the south. The last example I'll talk you through um, is not, it's actually not on a piece of National Trust managed land. It's a example which is uh, lo local to us. And this is mapped in OpenStreetMap as a track. And we noticed on the Ordnance Survey 1 to 50,000 scale map, so the UK's National Mapping Authority's um, record of this track, it's down as a, as a minor road. So the tags in OpenStreetMap are quite consistent to this. So it's designated access for uh, horse, foot, bicycle, and motor vehicle. But if we look at this track in reality, it, is, it matches the OpenStreetMap a uh, physical tag quite well. It's a, nothing more than a farmer's track, so perhaps only suitable for agricultural vehicles, uh, may, maybe 4x4s. Four four and we had a look at the, one of the routers that's just on uh, OpenStreetMap, and in this instance it would route um, a car down this, down this track. So as I, as I mentioned, it's not on National Trust land, but it's an interesting example of how we perhaps would tag this against um, the definitive, definitive information if it's not necessarily intended for, for that use case. 
So I'll pass you back over to Ian just to talk through the remaining implications and challenges we've had. Okay, uh, very quickly. Um, the reason we're here, there's three of us at the conference today, is we want to understand a bit better the, in these four areas. So one is crowd editing. We want to learn how to effectively utilize a crowd using a variety, OSM and the Rangers and uh, our staff, to work out how to do that effectively. We also want to understand the impact of tagging on routing algorithms so that we understand changing it from a, a paper map to a in-field navigation, what does that tagging mean? How do those tags influence what people are told? Then, our objective is to do it once, get it out there, anyone can use it. But the two most used in the UK for routing are probably the Ordnance Survey and Google. And neither of those can use the data we're going to put out there because of the share alike part of the um, open street map. That's their issue and partly it's a blocker to us so we want to understand a bit more around that. Uh, and then monitoring. We've, we're setting ourselves up as an authoritative editor. We're uh, adhering to a standard. We're policing. These aren't really OSM type terms so we'd like some feedback on what, how people see. We are the landowners, we do know what those paths are, what the legal definition is, what well, we are allowing additional access, and we'd like to get that right and we'd like to tell people. But if, do we have that authority to go around and undo people's edits? We don't want to get in a ding dong going yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. How do you manage that? Where our interests, we've always said that we'll never remove paths that exist on the ground, we'd just tag them. We'd say, um, what's the term again? Discourage, that was the tag that's used, discourage. Where we don't want people to use it, it's there, it's on the ground, but we'd prefer it that people didn't use it. So we'll leave you with that. So any of those, it's on, the, um, on our wiki page. We've got a discussion on there. Please go on, give us feedback. Let us know what you think. Uh, and thank you for your time. So thanks a lot to you for your talk. And are there questions? Hi there. Um, yeah, thank you for your talk. I was just um, interested in whether you are including information on accessibility, so uh, people with mobility impairments. I've missed the start of your talk, so you might have covered this, um, and how, you're, how you are um, tagging that and collecting that. I appreciate it might be a big answer, so I'm happy to talk about it afterwards. Yes, uh, we did cover it, but at the moment what we're focusing on is getting the geometry and the legal rights mapped. Once that's done, it's onto tagging schemas, which are a lot easier, and you don't need the same technical overhead in the field to edit those. So that's what we want to do in the next year, is recommend what, where we're going. And we're using uh, ODI Active, Open Active initiative, and we want to partner with those for difficulty and access type attribution. Questions? There's a question here. Um, I'll declare a slight interest here. I'm also a Ramblers right-of-way officer. However, one of the things that I'm very keen on with mapping and where OSM can beat Ordnance Survey is barriers. They're a big hindrance to people. Do you, are you intending to include the presence of styles, kissing gates, so that routing algorithms can avoid those? Yeah, those are exactly the sort of uh, barriers that uh, we are looking to capture. We're not doing it in the first phase, yeah. uh, but those are the things. We are, are trying to get rangers more engaged with capturing that kind of information at the moment so we can go with a data set to start yeah. with. Yes, I have a shorthand with my GPS when I'm walking to capture as much as I can. No, it would, it would be a good idea when we're engaging with the OSM community yeah. to have guidance on that from the start, yeah. that would make sense, but we are yes. concentrating yes. on what we've got there. Yes, it's one anecdote from one of my Rambler colleagues who works for Parish Path Partnership, and he went back a few days after they'd installed a kissing gate, and 
just to make sure it was all okay, it had settled into the ground correctly. And he met an old man that's just standing in the field, just looking in wonder. And he said, I haven't been able to get into this field for 15 years. <laughs> and that sort of is why this stuff's important. Anyway, thank you. <laughs> One last question, maybe, or two short ones, possible as well. Um, I think you touched a bit on your getting your ranges involved, or you're wanting to, um, and I'm just interested in how they've been responding it to. Because I know you're, you seem quite passionate about OpenStreetMap, which is great. But when you're telling your rangers, oh, we want you to do this, um, are there any challenges that you've had, maybe with them, or bad reactions that? maybe could help us learn from? Yeah, I think the biggest challenge for our ranger community is just their time and the and the, and the scope of work that they're expected to cover. So um, we've had a program running for the last four years around their GIS development. So we've been providing um, a lot of training on our internal GIS tools that we have um, that they use for work. So what we're, we're kind of hoping that now that we're engaging them in the OpenStreetMap side of things, that they've at least got a basic understanding of points, lines, and polygons and how things are represented in geographical space, and that we can sort of bring them into the sort of street map journey as we go. But actually, um, I think we found that they're, they're really interested um, as much about the um, the participation and engagement side of of, of OpenStreetMap as, as much as the uh, the sort of the, the, the mapping itself. Okay, so thanks a lot for your talk and all the best for the project.